Uh, anyway, well, that's uh, secret history. Um, uh, <laughs> well, I'm not trying to uh, focus on Anglo-Irish relations particularly, but what I want to show is how race or color difference is not the essential ingredient. I mean, the English and the Irish are both pale as moonlight. There's, you can't pin that on color. What we can also see is how such a history can be concealed so thoroughly behind very, very flimsy stereotypes. And in a country where 60% of the people have Irish blood, almost none of them have any idea of how really they got to be here. Everybody thinks it was because of the starvation during the potato famines. Nobody knows that during those years, the Irish were not just planting potatoes. They had bumper crops of wheat, but the English took it all, and they left Irish, the Irish to starve. But it was the potato famines. <laughs> anyway, uh, generally speaking, um, what I mean to say, it's not just the history of ethnic minorities in this country that are systematically suppressed or distorted. There are quite a few histories of European peoples that are also systematically suppressed and distorted in the mainstream. And one effect of this, whether, again, whether this is a deliberate effect or a side effect, I'm not uh, going to judge, but one effect for sure is to cause a lot of historically conditioned resentment to be misdirected and therefore futile, thus further injuring the resenter and the resentee, allowing the real culprit to be. Now this is a classic art of war. This is classic strategy. And um, I might add, I might point out that this is the real reason, the underlying reason why I've translated so much material on tactical science and strategic science to help people to see this kind of thing going on in everyday life, to see it more clearly, to understand it, and therefore to be able to take steps to become immune to it and not become infected by this sort of uh, delusive thinking. Now, um, to zero in on the real roots of human oppression, therefore, um, we have to look at the factors that rob people of their basic humanity, their basic sensibility. And this brings us back to religion and uh, the Islamic view of human depravity. In particular, the concepts of the devil and the false messiah. Now, the devil and the false messiah might be said to represent the essence of enslavement the things that lead to mental and material slavery. Now, I've noticed uh, everybody in this room stayed calm, but it's usually when you use terms like devil and false messiah, people react um, in a very perturbed or hostile manner, actually, as if it would seem they are accustomed to the use of these terms to arouse anxiety and fear and even hysteria. So to avoid this, I want to um, approach these concepts in a somewhat different way. Let me begin by citing the words of a modern Muslim scholar, Sayyid Iqbal Ali Shah, on the notion of invitation to evil, and I quote, just as our physical faculties are not by themselves sufficient to enable us to attain any object in the physical world without the assistance of other agents, so our own spiritual powers cannot by themselves lead us to do good or evil deeds. But here too, intermediaries which have an existence independent of our eternal spiritual powers are necessary to enable us to do good or evil deeds. In other words, continuing the quotation, there are two attractions placed in the nature of man, the attraction to good or to rise up to higher spheres of virtue, and the attraction to evil or to stoop down to a kind of low bestial life. But to bring these attractions into operation, external agencies are needed as they are needed in the case of the physical powers of man. The external agency which brings the attraction to good into work is called an angel, 
and that which assists in the working of the attraction to evil is called the devil. The proposition of the existence of the devils is as true as that of the existence of the angels, but while the Quran requires a belief in angels, it does not require a belief in the devils. If belief in angels were only an equivalent to an admission of their existence, a belief in devils would be an equal necessity. But it is not so. The reason is that whereas we are required to accept and follow the call of the inviter to good, we are not required to follow the call of the inviter to evil. And therefore, as the former gives us a basis for action, which the latter does not, we believe in the angels, but not in the devils. Uh, sounds good to me. <laughs> now, in Buddhist terms, uh, that was the end of the quote. In Buddhist terms, the phenomenon whose existence is recognized but not believed in is called an existing illusion. When you believe in it and act on it, it's no longer illusion, it's delusion. And that's the beginning of bondage and misery. So, this is why I believe the Prophet Muhammad said, may peace be upon him, God disregards any evil suggestion that occurs to people as long as it is not spoken of or acted upon. But what if we don't recognize the invitation to evil as suggestion? What if we think it's our own thoughts? Aha. Uh -huh. So, Passive disbelief isn't quite enough of a guarantee against invitation to evil if we don't recognize invitation to evil for what it is, if we think it's our own thoughts, in other words. So, we have to see the truth of it. As the Quran says, God hurls the truth at falsehood, and the truth breaks its head. We have to break the head of falsehood to be really free. And to do so, to see the truth of falsehood, that it is false. Now let me look at, at the uh, concept of the devil. In the Quran, the archetype of the Satan or the devil is a fallen angel. When God was going to create the human as a vice regent on earth, the angels got all upset and they protested to God, oh, there's going to be trouble. <laughs> God said, I know better than you. <laughs> and made the, made the human, and then commanded all the angels to bow to the human. And they all did except one, which was Iblis. Now, Iblis, then the angel Iblis is ejected from the presence of God. And in revenge, vows to spend the rest of time trying to prove the human corrupt, vowing to come upon the human in their faces and at their backs and to their right and to their left, and to prove that they're only clay and they're corrupt. Now, what I think is most significant is the name of that angel, Iblis, is traditionally uh, said to derive from the verb ablasa, which means he despaired. So despair, despair is the essence of the devil. Despair, particularly despair of the higher nature of man, despair of higher potential. So that's why I, I think that the, the notion that particularly racism is inherent, that is the devil, that's despair. That is despair, that is devilish suggestion. <laughs> Now, uh, turning to the false messiah, the Antichrist, or the lying messiah, one of my favorite names. <laughs> the Arabic term for this is ad dajjal which literally means to cover the whole camel with pitch. <laughs> and it comes from this. Um, pitch, or tar, was used as an ointment, an unguent for mange. Now, the, the name of the, the uh, Antichrist covering the whole camel with pitch means you're covering up the whole thing. A total deception. Covering up all the mange, particularly. Now, so it means deception or falsehood. 
That is the essence of the false messiah. Now, because the operation of the false messiah also makes use of suggestion, that is, suggesting falsehoods to cover up truth, I personally refer to the Dajjal as the pitch man, <laughs> which in colloquial English means someone who tries to get you to buy something you don't need. And uh, again, in colloquial English, to buy means to believe. I think that's quite revealing. <laughs> okay. Now, according to a uh, saying of the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, the pitch man, or the lying messiah, has only one eye and brings semblances of paradise and hell, casting the image of paradise on what is actually hell. Now, that one eye, this, this quality of having one eye, might be taken, I think, to refer to total materialism. See, the, like the image of human being as only clay, which is what brought the angel down. Sometimes I also think of the one eye as the television screen, which does bring false semblances, doesn't it? False hopes. So I, while I wouldn't necessarily say that was the pitch man itself, but the pitch man most definitely does use that one eye. And even, if, even this interactive stuff, I mean, it's still the program is there. You can't, uh, <laughs> there's only so much you can do. <laughs> anyway. Um, and there again, I think that itself is an unrealistic aim. That itself, the, this, this um, virtual reality idea that we can uh, create a, 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 an electronic reality that will satisfy us as human beings. Now, I think there is an image of paradise that's really hell. But we'll see. <clears throat> now, I'd like to take a couple of examples of... Uh, what I would refer to as one-eyed attitudes and false images of paradise covering hell, uh, using the phenomenon of spiritual alienation of labor, um, thus to also clarify the connections between deception, cultural robbery, and enslavement of mind and body. Uh, first, I would like to quote the statement of a craftsman, a Moroccan craftsman, which is uh, retold by the great Swiss scholar Titus Burkhardt in his remarkable book, Fez, City of Islam. Uh, this um, comb maker is what he was. This craftsman made combs out of horn. And he's lamenting the disappearance of authentic crafts in face of cheap, mass-produced products. I quote, it is not only a pity that today, solely on account of price, Poor quality combs from a factory are being preferred to much more durable horn combs, he said. It is also senseless that people should stand by a machine and mindlessly repeat the same movement while an old craft like mine falls into oblivion. My work may seem crude to you, but it harbors a subtle meaning which cannot be explained in words. I myself acquired it only after many long years. And even if I wanted to, I could not automatically pass it on to my son if he himself did not wish to acquire it. And I think he would rather take up another occupation. This craft can be traced back from apprentice to master until one reaches our Lord Seth, the son of Adam. It was he who first taught it to men and what a prophet brings for Seth was a prophet, must clearly have a special purpose, both outwardly and inwardly. I gradually came to understand that there is nothing fortuitous about this craft, that each movement and each procedure is the bearer of an element of wisdom. But not everyone can understand this. But even if one does not know this, it is still stupid and reprehensible to rob men of the inheritance of prophets and to put them in front of a machine where day in and day out they must perform a meaningless task." Unquote. Now, I don't want to give the impression I'm a Luddite or one of those who is against machinery. What I am objecting to is servility to machines. So let me, to make, make it clear what I'm talking about, let me rephrase this last statement. Even if one does not know that traditional crafts 
also have an inward function as well as an outward function, namely to bear, to concentrate and transmit elements of wisdom. Even if one does not know this, it is still stupid and reprehensible to rob men of the inheritance of prophets and to put them in front of a machine where day in and day out they must perform a meaningless task for only money, which itself has no intrinsic value, which can be manipulated and is manipulated day in and day out, outside of our control. Are we expected to buy with that money all of the satisfaction that we miss on the job? Is that right? Well, where do we buy that? I think, frankly, the spiritual alienation of work is one of the worst diseases of our time. And disdain for the work of the hands is, frankly, one of the most demented aspects of our culture. And I use the word culture advisedly. Part of the prophetic inheritance in work is the attitude of work, as indicated by the saying of the prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace. No one eats better food than that earned by the work of his own hands. Indeed, God's prophet David, peace be upon him, used to eat from the labor of his own hands. Now, I'd like to turn to American folklore to show how the, this principle, this honor for work, is demeaned in America, and how cultural instruments can be current and yet drained of all authentic meaning, and even perverted to uses, thoroughly at variance with their original intention. For this, I'd like to use the uh, well-known story of John Henry. This is one of the best-known stories in American folklore. Um, briefly stated, John Henry was a laborer who challenged a newly developed machine. The machine was supposed to be able to do the work of six men. John Henry challenged it. He beat the machine, but he died of a heart attack. Now, I first heard this story in the 1950s as a schoolboy. And we were told by the classroom teacher that the meaning of the story is that you can't fight progress. <laughs> this was the 1950s. Defy the machine and you die, <laughs> even if you win. <laughs> now, now, I think that's cruel to tell this to children, and I never forgot it either, <laughs> as you can see. <laughs> anyway, uh, the problem, one of the main, actually there are several problems, I don't have time to go into all of them, but, but the main problem with the standard versions of this story is that they neglect to include that critical line spoken by the bosses when they brought in the machine, without which it is impossible to understand the true purport of the story. Now the, the ordinary, the books they make for children say, the bosses bring in the, the machine and say, oh, John Henry, look at this wonderful machine, it can do the work of six men. And then, then John Henry says, oh yeah, and he challenges it out of pride. Well, we all know that what really happened when the bosses brought the machine, they said, hey, John Henry, look at this machine. It can do this work of six men. You're fired. <laughs> and you, you, and you. That's what really happened. And John Henry challenged the machine to save jobs. Now, the image of mechanization automation as the harbinger of wealth and leisure, unbounded, which has in fact been force-fed to the American people since childhood, has been, frankly speaking, for many a working person, an image of paradise that was really hell. Even though John Henry is portrayed as a hero, the meaning of his challenge to the machine as an attempt to save and peril jobs has been drained out of the story in the process of adoption into the mainstream. Even in recent versions where John Henry is more of an ethnic hero, his, his, um, his heroism is still uh, portrayed as individualistic and not connected to the redemption of his people. But if we, can, if we consider the fact, however, that the original John Henry was an ex-slave, a man who had just gotten out of slavery, now facing unemployment, you mean to tell me he challenges the machine out of pride? This is awfully cheap coin, but it is precisely the coin that we're, we're being taught to accept as a real value. Even culture itself, the idea that culture is, is for pride, a sense of pride, that's ridiculous. 
Culture is to develop the human being. Yes, it may make your parents proud of you, your children proud of you, but, culture, but being proud of yourself is not part of culture. Now, as a matter of fact, when we look at the, the real historical and, his, and, and cultural context of the John Henry legend, we realize, in fact, it's originally a Christian morality play. It's a story of redemption, of self-sacrifice, of sacrificing oneself for others. John Henry went to his death so that others might have jobs. The machine, which sadly does prevail in the world of matter, even though John Henry is victorious in the realm of spirit, represents the monster of the Roman Empire. The domain of the Caesar, the manifestation of sheer worldliness, which is is represented in the Christian book of Revelations as the monster. Now, to obscure this content and this meaning is not only to misrepresent American history and culture, but it is to rob people of the message of spiritual redemption. And this message of spiritual redemption is what really lies at the core of the story and represents the faith and the longing of enslaved peoples. So the process is still going on. Meaning is still being taken away from us. And what's the substitute? Pride and what? Now, I'd like to conclude this phase of the discussion by uh, bringing up the question of how much freedom we now actually have to question the role of machines, particularly computers and computer networks and virtual reality. Now, we can uh, cite things like the added difficulty of parental supervision when data can be made to disappear at the touch of a button. We can cite the added difficulty of shy adolescents developing healthy social personalities when they are more accustomed to interacting with machines. We can cite the added difficulty of developing a sound conscience when machines can give the sensation of wish fulfillment without any responsibility for consequences. But however we may think about these particular things, I think what we have to look at most of all is whether we are being induced to regard the computer as some kind of unquestionable savior. A savior which will solve our educational problems which will guarantee gainful employment and generally usher in an era of high-tech paradise. I wonder if we are in fact constrained from really questioning the true values and necessities of computers, if only because we don't want to appear unfashionable and backward to others, or if only because we simply assume that there's no turning back, as if it is to be taken for granted that we are in fact moving forward. Now for a capping word on this, I would like to again quote Titus Burkhardt, this in his own words, writing about the effects of Western modernism on Muslim society in Morocco. Quote, whereas previously men were differentiated only by their culture, the community is all of a sudden split into economically determined classes. And with the cheap products of the factory, a poverty without beauty invades the homes. Ugly, senseless, and comfortless poverty is the most widespread of all modern achievements. Let me repeat that. Ugly, senseless, and comfortless poverty is the most widespread of all modern achievements. I think it's very important to emphasize the words ugly, senseless, and comfortless the way Burkhardt does here, because material austerity is not necessarily bereft of beauty, meaning, and peace. It's the spiritual deprivation in this mass-produced poverty that adds insult to injury and that makes us prey to despair. And when we're in despair, we're vulnerable to suggestion. So the devil and the false messiah work together. Now, some people today, <clears throat> some of these revisionist uh, scholars for dollars, try to rationalize chattel slavery as the, as the grounds, uh, as, as necessary economically 
they tried to rationalize it on the grounds of, of economic necessity. Well, there was in fact no such necessity. The new world was brimming with riches and there was no need to exploit them with massive force. The irony is that most people today will condemn chattel slavery for its atrocity, and indeed this condemnation is politically correct, but yet material ambition and acquisitiveness, which are the real reasons and causes for slavery of all kinds, are still conveyed to the American people as worthwhile values. So we're locked to that extent in a hypocrisy that we can't even face. We're rushing headlong to our doom by means that have already betrayed our humanity. Under the guise of separation of church and state, secular pseudoculture has robbed even our folklore of its spiritual underpinnings and taught us to look upon this world itself as our final destination and to look upon dominion over this world as our final goal with nothing more to seek than satisfaction of worldly cravings, acting out of worldly fears, and servile worship of the false god of self-esteem. From this moribund idolatry, this pathetic servility, we can be liberated only by understanding ourselves and our world in a more complete way, not the way of the one-eyed, not the way of the pitch man. The question seems to be whether or not we're taught or, or whether or not we learn to make this world into a prison and to make ourselves into slaves of the world rather than slaves of truth. Let me give some ideas from Islamic teachings, finally, of how we can take control of this question. Here are some words from one of the earliest companions of the Prophet, upon whom be peace. In fact, the world is an abode of truth for one who is truthful with it, and an abode of well-being for one who understands it. It is an abode of riches for one who learns from it, and an abode of counsel for one who takes a warning from it. It is the house of worship for those who love God, the place of prayer of God's angels, the place of descent of God's inspiration, and the place of business of God's friends. Therein is mercy earned, and therein is paradise gained. So who reviles it when it has already announced its departure and declared it will leave? It has announced its own death and that of its people. By its trials it has given them an example of tribulation, and by its pleasures filled them with longing for pleasure. It started out with well-being and created misfortune, awakening desires and fears, causing alarm and alert. So some people revile it on the day of remorse, while others will praise it on the day of resurrection. For the world reminded them, and they bore it in mind, and it spoke to them, and they verified what it said, and it cautioned them, and they took the warning. Now, today's widespread cult of eternal youth and immediate, constant, and perpetual gratification is one that, unfortunately, by its nature, leads us away from foresight, responsibility, conscience, and a mature understanding of what we can actually do on Earth. So let me close with another indication from the same companion of the only choice, the only choice we really have on Earth. I quote, the world is a transitory abode, not a permanent abode. And the people in it are of two sorts. One who sells his soul and ruins it, and one who ransoms his soul and frees it. Dr. Cleary uh, wanted to end this with a chapter. He began it with Doha. He asked me to, to recite that uh, with Doha and the end. Before I, I say that, I just want to mention that um, 
Dr. Cleary is doing this uh, as a volunteer. He's not, uh, none of the, the money that was uh, asked of people here uh, goes to Dr. Cleary. And it actually goes to benefit the new school, which is a nonprofit organization in Oakland that's dedicated towards working with uh, um, the children in the schools there. And they're providing uh, literature and tapes and things. So it, it's actually going for, for that uh, purpose. Surat al-Insharah is the, the chapter which it means uh, to become expanded. And it's the idea of after feeling constriction or feeling uh, despair or a state of narrowness, the idea of that God expands the breast. And it's an ayah that was revealed after an ayah, the, the one that was read there, which was uh, a period of time when the Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, he didn't have, uh, the revelation d did not come for a period of time and people started saying, well, it's not coming to him and his lords left him and abandoned him and they, they were mocking him during that period. And the revelation itself, uh, when it came to him, was an extremely uh, difficult experience. Um, one of his companions, Abu Bakr, peace be, uh, may Allah be pleased with him, actually said that he was sitting next to him and when the revelation came, his uh, leg was under the thigh of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and he said that he thought his leg was going to be crushed from the weight. And it says in the Quran, uh, We will uh, thrust this heavy word to you. And so uh, there is actually some chapters of the Quran that when they were revealed, to the Prophet Muhammad, uh, he got gray hairs from them. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim. Bismillahi r-Rahman r-Rahim. Alam nashrah laka sadrak. ووضعنا عنك وزرك الذي أنقض ظهرك ورفعنا لك ذكرك فإن مع العسر يسرا إن مع العسر يسرا فإذا فرغت فانصب وإلى ربك فارغب صدق الله العظيم And that's translated uh, in Dr. Cleary's The Essential Quran as the expansion in the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. Have we not expanded your chest for you and removed your back-breaking burden from you and raised your repute for you? For truly relief comes with distress. Indeed, with distress comes relief. So when you are finished, be diligent still, and be attentive to your Lord. So I that uh, thank all of you very much for coming, and uh, certainly thank Dr. Cleary for the time and the insights that he shared with us tonight. Uh, and salam alaikum, peace be upon you.